When in doubt, blame Google sharing. That works pretty well for me. <laughs> All right. So welcome again. Awesome. Project Browser on the road to core. We are getting very close to uh, getting Project Browser towards a, a merge request into core, but there's still quite a bit to do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Who are we? My name is Chris Wells. Uh, you can find me on pretty much everywhere as Chris from Redfin. Um, and Chris from Redfin.dev, you can find me links to all the, all the socials and all the things you need. And this is Aaron Winborn Award winner, Leslie Glynn. She hates when I do that, so I do it all the time. Uh, we're both from Redfin Solutions. We're based in the other Portland, Portland, Maine. Um, and we are the co-initiative leads for Project Browser. So we'll start at the beginning. What is Project Browser? Uh, the project, project Browser, when Dries introduced us at DrupalCon in 2021, the Project Browser makes it easy for site builders to find and install modules. And the, the year after, he said, find and install modules with, with a click of a button, so automatically install it. So that is what we've been working towards. So what does it do? How many people are new to Project Browser in the room? I, re I don't recognize a lot of faces. Oh, awesome. So we're gonna go through a few slides at the beginning. Some people who have worked on Project Browser, so this is like a, a recap of what, you know, how it works. So, all right, so what does it do? All right. So if you wanna spin up a version of the Project Browser, it's very simple. You just click the Try It Now button off the Project Browser page. Uh, the project page on drupal.org. So it's just drupal.org slash project slash project underscore browser. Click on try it now, um, and that will spin up a site. You do need a GitHub account uh, or a GitLab account to do that. Uh, and as you go through, it's just accept the defaults as you go, and it will come up with a Drupal 10 site with project browser installed. Um, and that way you can look at it and, you know, give us feedback, check things out, and help us work on it on Contrib Day. Ooh, look at that, I got the power from over here. One thing I wanna to add to that is it does say that the current release is beta five. When you use that try it now button though, it is using 1.0.x head. So it, you're getting the latest and greatest when you hit that try it now button. Yep. All right, so that's how you spin it up. Now how do you find it? So. Chris is gonna tell you a little bit about some usability studies that were done on Project Browser. Um, but right now, you go to Extend, because that's where you go to add modules, right? Go to Extend and there's a new Browse option underneath that, and that's how you get to the Project Browser. We are, we do have an issue out there, if someone wants to work on it, to make Browse the default. So when people go to open up a new Drupal site, it'll have the page where you can actually browse some modules versus the list that you're used to that shows all modules that are currently within your website. So we definitely need help if anybody wants to help with that one. Um, and we would have to add a list option also to get you to the list page that's the default now. So basically, to get to Project Browser, run the Try It Now, and then just after you log in, we have a very secure login, admin, admin. Um, and then just go to Extend and Browse. So what do you see when you get there? So you're going to see, I know this is a little hard to see, um, a grid of module cards. So each module that's returned uh, from your search will have a card. It'll have a logo, a short description, and some categories listed there. And then some other information on there which we'll get to. Um, there are options for the number of cards you want to display on your page. So there's a lot more than what we're showing today. So we're just trying to give you a snapshot of, of how it works and what capabilities that are there. But there are, like I said, a, a grid of cards. There's also filters. We'll go over the filters next, and then there's some sort options, okay? So again, the, what it brings you back, if you, use the, if you just spin it up, the default filters are one, which is very good. Um, it only brings you back modules or projects that are compatible with your version of Drupal. So if your site is a Drupal 10 site, you're not gonna get Drupal 7 modules in this big, huge list. You're only gonna get things that are compatible with Drupal 10. And do you wanna just speak up about 10.x.x? 
and say, so it's, it's going to bring you back the major version, Drupal 10. Yeah. The way that that actually works is it looks for uh, any release of that module that will work with your uh, specific version of Drupal. So it's slightly possible that if something was compatible with, like, say, up to Drupal 10.0 or 10.2 and above, and you're running 10.1, you might see it show up in the browser, but then say not compatible with your version of Drupal. But for the most part, um, we're able to just pre-filter those out so that you don't see them. And, and I forgot to say the goal of the project browser is to make it easy for site builders. So that's our audience, site builders and those who are new to Drupal. So based on what Dries said in the initiative keynote today, we're looking at that target audience of people that just want to come in and spin up a site uh, very easily, so that's our goal here. Um, so the default filters, I mentioned one. There's also, you'll see the two blue buttons there. One is that it's actively maintained, so we only want to bring back modules that are, you know, have a maintenance status of, you know, somebody's working on them, not things that haven't been worked on for 10 years that, you know, are out of date. So we only bring back actively maintained modules by default, and we all, all also only bring back modules that are um, covered by the security policy, because that's very important in Drupal, so we do, we do that. Now, there are advanced filters. If you want to bring back all modules, whether or not they have security coverage, you can do that. If you want to bring back all a, mod, you know, a list of modules that aren't, aren't um, actively maintained, you can, you can do that. That's for more for advanced users, the advanced filters, but the, um, the defaults will get you what you need, okay? And it also displays the categories, which we'll get to in a minute. So the categories, um, there were 55 categories when we started this project on Drupal.org. So when somebody go, went to create a project, they got to select categories. There's actually one that was added the last week or the week before that had 51 categories selected for it. So we've reduced that to maximum of three categories. This was, there was a lot of work that went into this. A lot of people contributed and helped us to narrow that down. But there are now 19 categories that you can choose from, and you can only have a max of three. A lot of times, one is all you need, because your module fits into you know, one category. But this is a way for folks to come in and search for modules. I only want to find modules that are SEO. So you're going to look for that category, that tag. Um, and there's a few lists there. There's also category descriptions. There's a page that has each one of the categories with a definition of what we feel would, f what the community feels would fall into that category. So that's very helpful for people who are using this for the first time or, you know, are trying to find modules. What, what, what I find in this particular category, okay? It will take all the questions at the end, so just save them up. Um, sorting. By default, we bring back the most pop in the order of most popular first. So a module that has 10,000 installs will show up before a module that has two installs, for instance. That's the default. But you can also sort them in alphabetical order, either way, A to Z or Z to A. And you can sort them by newest first. So you're interested in new modules, you know something's just come out, you can s search by newest first. Okay, so on the bottom right, you'll see that blue button, and you can't read it too well from probably f without having these slides, but the, um, the options are it's already installed, so it'll say installed if it's already been installed, right? If it hasn't even been put into your code base yet, there'll be an add and install option, which says add it to the code base and install it. But if it's already been added, they'll just be an install. So those are automatic, those buttons. What, what, allows you, what you're allowed to do is based on the status of your modules that you have in the code base. That's all done through the uh, automatic updates and um, package manager. Those other initiatives have really helped a lot in, in terms of be, allowing people, instead of having to go to um, a browser window, and saying, you know, Drupal require or whatever to get a module, you can now install modules right from this browser, which is, again, in line with what Dries was talking about today. All right, so the default is a grid view, as I showed you, the square card with information on it. You can also view a list view. So the list view has the same information on it as the card view, but you can see 
you know, more. It's more compact than the card view. But it has a logo, short description, the categories, and then some of the options. But the same information is presented regardless of which way you go. All right, so when you click on it, when you go to the, the, uh, the grid that has the cards on it, and you click on a particular project because you want to find out more information than just the, the, the short description and the categories, right? You want to, it actually calls out to Drupal.org to, to get the details. Now, right now, that's just a, a page that was created with the, the uh, concept of just show us that we can get information from Drupal.org to show on that detail page. We now have a design um, and of what we'd like, so we need folks to help us with this this week. This layout right here, so this is what we're looking at doing, where you have s some of the information from Drupal.org, but not all of it. We're not going to put the issue queue here, for instance. We're not going to put all the information, but we're going to put the key information that we talked to, I don't know, probably 100 different users over the course of, a, you know, when we've been doing this. We t uh, had listening sessions. We let them use it. Com feedback coming back was this is the information that they most likely would want to see on the detail page. Now, you can go to Drupal.org using that bottom button, link to Drupal.org's project page. We need usability help in coming up with a better, shorter term for that. But click on that, and you actually go to Drupal.org in a new window so you don't lose your browser session. You'll go to Drupal.org to get all the information that you currently see, like the issue queue and that information. But this, hopefully, is enough of a snapshot to let you, let you determine do I want to look at this module further, or is it not something that you know solves my issue or meets my needs? Okay, so we're working on that uh, on Wednesday. We'd love some help. All right, so Chris is now going to do. How did we get here? So there's um, a lot of work that went into getting, you know, to this point. Um, one of the first things that we kind of really discovered about this is kind of we hear this in computer science a lot is kind of garbage in, garbage out, right? So looking at the data that we're actually using. So as Leslie said, we actually thought as part of this initiative, we need to actually revamp the categories on Drupal.org. We need to go in and say, these 54 categories are overwhelming, they're too much, and we need to simplify. So, for example, we looked at other CMSs, WordPress, Typo3, um, and, and looked to see how many categories were they using, somewhere between 15 and 25 or so. So we said, okay, I think we can do better than that. Um, so we also had to look at logos for Project Browser. We had this uh, beautiful uh, card layout that was sort of dependent on each project having a logo that was kind of associated with it. And we actually were able to get volunteers to create logos for the top 100 um, modules that show up by, by install and get logos for them all created. And we're still doing that. So if you are a maintainer, per chance, and you would like a logo, uh, you can file an issue, and we have volunteers ready to help create a logo for your project. And this will be helpful as we continue on into phase two and phase three and start thinking about things like uh, ecosystem, right? There's a lot of modules out there that extend web form, for example, or extend commerce. And so we're able to harken back to the logo for commerce and bring in uh, those, those add-ons visually so that people know that things belong to sort of the same ecosystem. Uh, so we talked about the categories, logos, and then the short descriptions, like being able to see valuable information on that card about what does this module do in a you know one to 200 character description. We had people going through and writing these short descriptions for the top 100 modules. So if, again, you are a maintainer, we have a link here to the maintainer handbook, which will let you know all of the things that you need to do as a maintainer to make sure your module shines inside of the project browser. One second, Chris. Um, for maintainers? You got to flip it on. Sorry, for maintainers. Um, so we had some, we had in, uh, cont contributors do the top 100 logos, top 100 short descriptions. We are dr gonna drop issues in the pr project's queue for the maintainers to say, here's a suggested logo. Another issue will be, here's a suggested short description. The maintainers have to, have to actually go into 
uh, on the project page in Drupal.org and make those changes, but we, we have worked on suggestions for you to do that. And the same with categories. We're gonna be looking at that this week as well. If you just wanna come and say, okay, read what the project does and um, you know, select the, the category it should belong in, you certainly, we certainly can use help with that. Another thing that was super helpful to us was we were able to uh, latch on to uh, some usability studies that were being performed on a lot of this new work that was happening in Drupal. We did some real user testing uh, with our friends at the University of Minnesota and their usability lab, so we were actually able to get some real users, put this in front of them and say, is this obvious to you? Does this work for you? Um, and we, we worked with the new navigation module, was also being tested and uh, a couple of other things, but we were able to test out the project browser and came up with, there's an issue here about all the things that sort of came out of it, but two of the biggest usability things were, I can't find it and I didn't even realize that we were supposed to filter by category. So we've been working with uh, the usability group and some other folks to figure out ways around those like pretty glaring usability issues. So the next piece, and there, there was obviously a lot more that went into getting us to the point we're at, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how does this do it? This is something that's really kind of new and cool and something that we are pushing for to get included into core, and we'll see how it goes, but we have some tentative blessings thus far, but we're actually using a progressively decoupled architecture, so most of the browser that you're seeing is actually an app written with the JavaScript framework Svelte, uh, Svelte is my favorite, um, which actually had, had nothing to do with me joining on. It's just a kind of coincidence. Um, but it's my favorite front-end framework currently. And it's using a decoupled architecture where we're actually making API calls to your Drupal site to ask for the modules and things and what's available. So um, we connect to the Drupal site, and then the Drupal site is in charge of getting us data. So it might have to call a different API endpoint, it might use a local database, it might use uh, you know, a Google Sheet as the, as the database. And let's talk about that for a minute. So what's very cool about the architecture is that the backend source plugins are Drupal plugins. So you can write your own uh, source data set of where you would like to get project data from. For example, if you are at a university, you don't want to give your users access to install any module under the sun, you just want them to use your hundred or so curated modules. You can write your own uh, project browser plugin, make that be the only one you enable, and then your users can only install from the UI, those modules that are on your approved list. So that works pretty well. We have some example source plugins in there, and we have a handbook page about how to write it. Um, so there's a lot of really good uh, information on writing your own custom source plugins. And I think, uh, you know, one use case for this is simply doing an allow list of only these certain modules, and that would be a really cool contrib opportunity of having a way where you can just specify what projects are allowed, and it only uses that data. So one thing that I neglected to say is, um, by default, it only brings back contrib modules, but there is a source plugin to allow you to bring back core modules as well. So if you're looking for, you know, layout builder or something that's in core, you're not going to see it by default, um, but you will be able to get to that just by saying, yes, I want to include core modules in in what I'm seeing in Project Browser. The way that we are currently implementing the, the sort of database of modules that are available is actually with a fixture. So we are periodically going out, scraping Drupal.org's Drupal 7 uh, JSON API, or uh, I, I don't know if it's JSON API or, what is it? Yes, REST WS, the old, man, I had to really get that out of the old noodle. That was um, from back in the day. So uh, scraping Drupal 7's RESTWS and building up a JSON fixture, and when you enable Project Browser, it installs that list of modules that are current as of the time we generated that fixture, and that's mocking for us how we can install modules. Uh, the DA has recently committed to a late June date to having a real API endpoint stood up for us, and so we can actually be able to query live data from Drupal.org. 
But for now, this fixture works uh, fairly well for uh, being a proof of concept, and it even works, uh, there are drush commands to periodically update the data you have in your local site, so you can actually once a week just kind of get newer information into your site if you would like. Um, and so recently, and very recently, like last week, uh, I was able to upload a fixture that now represents our new 19 categories, because um, up about a week and a half ago, the fixture was old enough that it was still displaying the old uh, 54, 55 categories. Uh, the only, uh, one of the major limitations though of this is um, there's no real search, right? So eventually when we stand up an endpoint, it's going to be backed by solar. So if for example, you search by the name of a module, the module named that will come back first, right? Because we're able to weight the title of the project more importantly. Right now, our s keyword search is a very dumb like contains. So you can search for address, but the address module won't be the first thing to come up because something else also mentions address. So um, those are sort of known limitations of using this, this fixture approach right now. So, uh, there is a configuration page for Project Browser, which is something we haven't talked a lot about um, in, in previous presentations, but this is where you can actually go to enable the functionality to allow installations. So that is off by default because there is a dependency on package manager. You have to make sure that's installed. Also, we wanted users to be able to turn it off, right? Maybe you do not want users to actually run composer commands through the UI. You want them to see what's available, but then maybe you want them to make a request to IT to actually put that module on your site. You know, maybe you just want a browsable directory, but not something actionable. So uh, it has that dependency. You must enable that functionality. And the other thing you can do on this config screen, it's probably a little hard to see from where you're at, but each source plugin that you enable, you can turn certain ones on, off, and you can reorder them. So for example, you can turn on the core source plugin and the contrib source plugin, and you could put the core one first or the core one second. It's up to you. So there's a little bit of config associated there. Uh, are there any plans or is there any implementation currently for permissions? Like a content editor could see the marketplace did not install, but a like a IT role user could go in and install mm -hmm. via this. Yeah, right now our uh, permission is uh, can use project browser, and that's pretty much it. Um, but I, I, I anticipate that we would fraction that out a little bit so that uh, some people could add an install and others could just see. Uh, so yes, what are we waiting for? Uh, like I said, we already talked about that uh, commitment from the DA, trying to get that real API endpoint stood up. Um, and the, if I have anything to say, it's that we need to throw as many resources as we can at the DA. They are a small but mighty team and there's always more work to do than there are people to do it. So uh, any, if, if there's any one takeaway you have here, please donate to the association, become a member if you're not a member, whatever, whatever you need to do. Um, they are doing some very heavy hitting projects right now with key cloak and single sign on, uh, the update framework for signing for automatic updates to make sure that we are securely updating your code base. So very cool stuff happening over there. Okay. And then finally, what can we actually do moving forward? What is it that we actually need to work on still? So there are only two alpha blockers right now, and the work for those are largely done and just waiting on um, things to happen in that sort of stack of dominoes. So beta blockers are really the biggest chunk of work that we have to do, and tons of those are really related to just finalizing the UI. We need people who have not seen Project Browser to come in and validate some stuff for us. I was just talking to, to Mike Herschel about, I have written and revised some error messages. The usability group has seen it, I've seen it, but we need someone who has like never worked with Project Browser to just tell us if these error messages make sense so that we can change the text update it and get that committed. So there's tons of small things that you can help with even if you don't think that you're like, I'm not technical, I don't know how to write Svelte code. Um, which again, even if you don't know how to write Svelte code, come by. A lot of these issues that we're actually down to are just, we need 
someone to look, and they're, they're actually um, somewhat simple. Uh, for example, we kind of have an issue sampler here of, um, you know, we need some input on whether or not we should replace a wrench icon with a gear icon, if, that's, if that makes more sense to a user about uh, conveying our maintenance status. We have um, the idea that we should put a legend somewhere, but we don't know where to put it. We need someone with an eye for design to just say, you know, I would make it horizontal and put it right above, or I would make it a, a pop-up, or I would whatever it happens to be. So we need some feedback on those kinds of issues. Whether or not we should make the detail page a modal instead of a separate route. Um, and even issues as simple as limiting the line length on the cards. Right now, if you have a really wide screen, it gets too long to be readable. And we need, you know, there's a very simple CSS fix that can be tied to that. So there are a lot of these issues that um, we want to work on, and also if you would like to see what you can do, you can go to bit.ly slash pbcontributions and see a good Google Doc of sort of the, our, our hottest issues, and we're always updating that document to... Um, Oh, and as Leslie tells me, those are, those are also broken down by, is this an issue for documentation? Is this one for a designer? Is this one for front end, back end? So check out that document. Again, bit.ly slash PB contributions, no dash or anything. All right, back to Leslie. Project browser this week. Sure, and I know you probably all have a lot of questions and we'll get to that in a minute. So this week, um, there are contribution opportunities all, every day in the general contribution room, which happens to be next door. So jo just stop in, look for Chris or I, and you know, we can help you get started. You have a break, you're not going to a session, you want to just come by and see what you might be able to do, definitely come by there um, next door. Uh, this is the session that's listed on Monday right there. I put that on there so that people that are watching the recording, um, you know, obviously they know that this is our session. The, uh, we have a BOF, which is, for those of you who don't know, a BOF is more of a discussion versus presenters presenting information to you. It's just a discussion about a topic. And I think what we decided to do was project browser for module maintainers. That doesn't mean that anybody in here that's not a module maintainer can come, because some of the conversation might be, how can folks help the module maintainers make those changes that we talked about, you know, write the 200 character descriptions or you know, create a logo because they don't have a designer on their team, for instance. So definitely come to the BOF. It's just a general discussion. It's a half hour, um, and we'd love to see everybody there tomorrow. It's at 1 o'clock in G132. And Chris and I don't know where the Gs are yet, so we have to find those. Upstairs and go right. Excellent. Thank you. Up see upstairs you upstairs and go right. Thank you. Um, and then Wednesday, which is Contribution Day. How many people have never been to a Contribution Day? All right, so I used to go to Contribution Day years ago, and I would get there, and just trying to get a local setup would take the entire day, and I never got anything done, and it was so frustrating. I went like three years in a row and never contributed anything. Nowadays, we have tools that make it very easy for you to contribute, uh, and nowadays we have tasks for documentation, tasks for site builders, tasks for people who are brand new here, who have never been to DrupalCon before, who have never really you know, been involved with Drupal, just come and test things out. Let us know from our, our um, target audience, are those who are new to Drupal. So if you're new, don't feel like, I can't go to Contribution Day, I don't have anything to contribute. You have a lot to contribute. You can really help us out a lot. So anybody in the room, back-end code, front-end code, UX documentation, we really need everybody there. Um, so thank you in advance. But I will be in the mentored contribution room there are mentors that walk around and help. So they say, what issue are you working on? Whatever questions you might have. I will be helping, but there'll be other mentors in that room as well. Chris will be in the general contribution, and the mentored contribution room is this room, actually. Um, the mentored contribution is next door. I mean, sorry, the general contribution is next door. And that's more, uh, there's tables, but Chris will have uh, issues for you to work on, specifically, that, you know, maybe some of the more technical. Um, but you come to I, come, stuff. yeah. Yep. Come to either room. Uh, definitely come though if you're around on Wednesday. It's a great opportunity. You meet a lot of people in the community, which can help, and they help you on other things. I've met so many people just by 
contributing. So I definitely recommend if you're around to come to that. All right, so how can you join the initiative? This is great, people are here, this is DrupalCon, but on an ongoing basis, how can you keep in touch with what's going on? How can you find out how you can help, how your other folks at your company can help? Um, we have a, a Slack, uh, on Drupal Slack, we have a channel, uh, project, project-browser. So join that channel, there's conversation going all, all the time there, and just ask your question. Hey, I'm trying this out, can you explain what, you know, you know, I can't log in, because you forgot that I said admin, admin. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, hop on the, the channel. Also, this is, I was, I basically lead this call on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's more of the site builder subcommittee. We did a lot in the descriptions, the logos, the categories, you know, more of, for folks who are maybe not as technical, don't want to learn Svelte, but want to help out. So that's on Tuesdays at 4. And the general meeting, which Chris runs, is on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern. Those are both in the Slack channel. So they're both asynchronous. So if you can't make those times because you are, you know, in a country that's, you know, in a totally different time zone and you're in bed at the time, it's asynchronous. It's just threads with conversation. So hop in there and just add your thoughts to any of the things that we were talking about. You get credit for, you know, just going there and helping us out, giving us information, or volunteering to, you know, help us, you know, with a certain UX issue. You know, oh, man, that one you talked about with, you know, redefining the, the project detail page, you know, I really want to work at that, on that, so, and you can't do it this week, just let us know. Um, check the issue queue, um, work on some of the issues we already talked about, and I really want to thank everybody who contributed so far. We've probably had 100, I would say around 100 people contribute to Project Browser so far, but from designers to UX people, you know, for the logos, the descriptions, because every, every time we go to DrupalCon or any Drupal camp, we run these uh, contributions, so don't feel like, oh, I, I can't do that. There's 100 people who have already said, yes, there's something that I can do. All right? And I just want to say thanks to all who have contributed so far. And I think that's all we have. So we're ready for Q&A. Yeah. You want to? OK. So why don't, want me to run the microphone? Can we take that out, take it off uh, or no? No, it's just wired. Oh, but it's wired. I can so repeat questions. OK. So what questions do we have out there? I'm brand new to, I, and I don't code, Love not it. a. You're our target audience. I'm in a site. local environment, and I tried for like a couple hours and then said, that's not for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but this is like super interesting to me because I use WordPress a lot. seems very much like that. It's compatible. There's an update available. Click it, install it. Um, when it checks for compatibility, does it, it can't check like if one module is going to break another module, or is that even a thing? So the question is about uh, whether or not dependencies are sort of resolved correctly or if installing something might break something else. And so I, I think the short answer of that is what the installer is doing for you here is using Composer behind the scenes. So we're farming all of that dependency management out to Composer and just sort of hiding it from you. So Composer is going to reconcile, oh, you're trying to install, I don't know, Web Form 4X, but you have C Tools 3X installed, and we would need to upgrade that. Or, and being able to notify you and say, so we're going to pass through, hopefully in a friendly way, any of those dependency conflicts or anything that happens from Composer. So um, usually you don't run into issues where it's like, yes, it will let you install them, and one will break the other. Um, but we are, we are doing what we can to prevent that um, to the extent that we're able to farm it out to Composer. Who yeah. will like, throw a warning and say, hey, this might... Yes. Something else. Yeah, 
Absolutely, or it'll either uh, prevent it from installing and tell you why, um, or it will have, like if it fails to install and sort of breaks part way through, uh, Package Manager is really good at keeping all that off of your actual site code until it knows that it can apply cleanly before copying it back. So it's able to give you those kinds of warnings. Yeah. Right. And, and by default, it does install any dependent modules. So if you're installing module yeah. A and it depends on module C being there, it'll install both of those for you. Yep, it will, yeah, good point. It will install dependencies in the same way that Composer would do that. Yeah. Way down the back. You want to have him come up? The question is whether or not we can install patches through the UI, which currently in Project Browser, that is not on the roadmap. We figure if you're installing patches, you are probably not our target audience of those who are new to Drupal. Um, so if you're installing patches with Composer patches, you're probably comfortable editing your Composer JSON yourself. So there's currently no plans to implement uh, the ability to patch things. Um, with that said, Let's say you're an organization and you have a distribution where you're always using a patched version of something like, you know, you're running paragraphs with these three patches around your organization. Uh, if you can expose that to Composer and have your, your custom project browser source plugin, um, you could fetch that dependency from like your local GitHub or something and you could install the patched version that way and that would work. Other questions? Yes. Maybe you have a couple here. Um, this might be outside the scope, but I'm still trying to get my head around how this works in the, for, with regard to Postgres. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm hosted on Pantheon, which requires Composer. Um, this uses Composer, so potentially you could host a site that uses Postgres on Pantheon, assuming Pantheon has a setup for it. Does that sort of have the right universe? Yes. You're totally in the right spot. So the real question is about how does this actually work with hosting and, and how could it actually work? So the, the, one of the easiest things to think of is I'm just going to use this locally. I'm going to use it you know, on my local development environment. I'm going to do maybe a config split so that Project Browser doesn't even get turned on in live environments or anything at Pantheon. And then I push and I use my normal workflow. Another option though is, and I can't specifically say if this would work with Pantheon, but what you really need is right access to your code base and the ability to run Composer. So uh, something like Pantheon, where your dev is in live development mode, I could see that working, where you could run the project browser there in dev, in live uh, live dev mode. Or is that an awkward thing? I don't I know, know, I'm mixing up my things, but. For Pantheon, it's like you could. Mode SFTP mode, that's the one, yeah. So I'm thinking of maybe Aquia Live Dev, but same, same idea. If you can have access to your code base and your, your web user has right access, it, it would work. So that is, yes, you are thinking about it in the right, in the right scope. Yeah, here. Yeah, and again, this is a little bit more specific to Pantheon and, and around the issue that we, we frequently run into, which is kind of like, how would I use this as an advanced developer? You probably wouldn't, right? You, you're probably managing things yourself. But with that said, yeah, um, most of Project Browser typically is working inside of the contrib space, and most of the Pantheon upstreams are in the core space, and so there's not really conflicts there, uh, depending on what you're using for your upstream. And I think I saw a question over here, yeah. Yeah, I, I saw one of your the filters for like development patches. I yes. Know yeah, so um, the question is around the filter for, one of the advanced filters for development status. So there are a, a couple of fields that module maintainers have access to when they're creating a project on drupal.org. One is that they can specify their maintenance status and one is they can specify their development status. So there's a, a pick list where you can say this is, this module is actively being developed. So like 
we're, we're working on it, don't even expect it to work yet, versus uh, it's in a maintenance cycle where we think it does everything it needs to do and we're just updating it. So uh, what we've actually done with both of those filters is um, taken the statuses that we think represent actively maintained or actively developed and ones that we think are not and have sort of turned those four or five options into a Boolean. So for example, for maintenance status, if you say actively maintained, it's actually two or three of the five possible statuses up through seeking co-maintainer. Uh, we count that as actively maintained. Over here. Uh, that work is, uh, sorry, the question is about how does search scoring and keyword relevance play in given the fact that we're kind of doing this two hop process from the Svelte app to your local Drupal site and then your local Drupal site out to drupal.org. So the question is like, where does the scoring happen? Is it on the, the Drupal site installation or on drupal.org? We are anticipating that that comes back from drupal.org. So just like today, when you run a, a search on drupal.org and you type in a keyword, it will boost that, handle that, and figure out what's most relevant. So that response will come directly back to the Drupal site and get passed down. So that's all gonna be handled. Uh, and that's great because it allows us to sort of continually revise and tweak the solar scoring algorithm on the drupal.org side. Any other questions? I have one clarification um, while you're thinking of other questions. Uh, the fixture that Chris talked about, I know that might be a little technical for those of you who are new. That is just a way to bring in a sampling of data from Drupal.org at the time that he creates the fixture. So it's not real time, it's not up to date. So if, you, if you're trying to test project browser and you say, hey, I added a new module and it's not there, or I know this module was just updated and you know, you're not showing it correctly, that's just because we don't have a, a real time polling from Drupal.org at the time, at the current time, but eventually, by the end of June, I think is when the DA has said that they will have that real time. So when he was talking about the endpoint, that's really just pulling the data into Project Browser from directly from Drupal.org as it stands right now versus when we created that, that group yeah. of it, uh, that snapshot. data. Snapshot, yeah, yeah. Point That snapshot, time. yeah, correct, yeah. to pull in. So I just wanted to clarify that in case it was kind of technical for some of you. Any, la yep, go ahead. Yeah, I like that. The question is about how did sort of Leslie and I from Redfin happen to like stumble into this particular space? And uh, for me, I have sort of made my living off of Drupal for the last 18 years and I felt like a mooch and I figured it was time to be uh, a maker, not a taker. So I just said, it's time to contribute, I need to stop being scared of the contribution process and just put myself out there. So I just kept showing up, going to all the meetings simply because I wanted to contribute and I found an opportunity to contribute in a big way. So I was able to hop onto Project Browser early on. And I mean, with that said, I really had incredibly little contribution experience leading up to that. I just knew that I kind of had to do something and I just kept showing up to this initiative. It just, the timing worked out really well. And originally Leslie was too busy on, uh, you were on the board, Drupal Association uh, board and she was doing so much. Uh, so I originally had a different co-maintainer and when they dropped off, it happened to coincide very well with Leslie's uh, term being up at the board and other things she was doing. But, right, but anything the, else the, you wanna say? Yeah, so the reason I got involved honestly Dries was presenting at a Dries note like he was today, and he talked about Project Browser, and I had been doing a lot of training in Drupal, training new people to Drupal, and I'm there, wow, this would be incredible. This would so, you know, be so useful for the audience of people that I was working with. So I said, yeah, this is, also I'm not a Drupal developer. I do have some development background from years ago, 
but I said, you know what, this is great opportunity for folks like me to actually contribute something useful. And if you contribute to Project Browser or any of the initiatives, think about it, and they go into core, right? Core means all Drupal sites from then on will contain that. How cool is that, that you actually worked on something that is gonna be all, all the Drupal sites? So think of it that way, and there's opportunities for everybody, so. But that's why I got involved. So hopefully people will get involved in some of the initiatives that Dries mentioned today for a similar reason. It's something that they feel that they are passionate about or they have some background in and they can definitely help out with those. But as Chris said, the Drupal Association has so many great things to work on and they're a small but mighty team. They just have you know a handful of uh, developers working on things like the infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. So anything you can do to help them out time, talent, you know, working on these issues, whatever, would be super helpful. Anything else? No, that's great. Um, got about three more minutes in case there are some other questions, but otherwise, uh, before we go, just want to say thank you for coming out, and thank you for your interest, and, you know, find us in the hallway, find us wherever, find us on Slack, we're always happy to help anyone that wants to contribute, especially if, you know, I, again, I know it's daunting, and a little bit scary, and I promise you I will hold your hand at every step of the way if that's what you want. So I'm happy to have people contribute. Awesome. Good question. How do you uh, undo Project Browser? So at the end of the day, you can always, you can of course turn the module off. You can just say, I don't want this anymore. I'm just going to go back to the old way. They're rarely compatible because at the end of the day, it's just running the same commands that you would run locally in, in your in your CLI. They, it's not even an either or situation. I can go and install Path Auto through the UI, and then I can go to my terminal and install, you know, token. Uh, well, that's a bad example because Path Auto would install token, but uh, you know some other module the way I want, and you can always sort of mix and match and go back and forth, which is what makes it really cool. Um, what we do not have is the ability to sort of uninstall and remove modules through the Project Browser UI. So you can uninstall any module the same way you would uh, from the uninstall page. Uh, we do not have functionality that will run like the composer remove command to get it out of your code base. So that's um, that is on the roadmap for after our MVP iteration, but that's something that is kind of like, mm, getting it in is a little bit more important than getting it out. <laughs> cool. Thank you again, everyone, so yeah, much. Thank you for coming and enjoy the uh, opening reception.